Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video course about stochastic and statistical properties. And now in today's part 19, we will talk about the covariance and correlation. I can already tell you, the covariance is similar to the variance we have defined in the last videos, but now it takes two random variables as an input. And now you might already know, two random variables can influence each other and the covariance is one possibility to measure this influence. Hence, it can tell us if there is a correlation between the random variables. However, you also might know, before we start with the topic, I really want to thank all the nice people who made these videos possible. In particular, I want to thank all the nice supporters on Steady, on Patreon, or here on YouTube. And as a reward, you find PDF versions, quizzes, and exercises for all the videos on my webpage. Okay, with that I would say, let's start with the first definition here. And as often, the main ingredient we need is a probability space consisting of a sample space omega, a sigma algebra a, and a probability measure p. And as already mentioned before, we need two random variables x and y. Moreover, we need some assumptions there, because we will calculate some integrals. For example, we need that the expectation of x exists. However, we have seen it for the variance definition, we also need that the expectation of x squared exists. And obviously, this is even a stronger assumption, and we also want that for y. So in short, these two integrals should exist, so they should be finite. And then, we are able to define the so-called covariance of x and y. And here you see, this is the common abbreviation we have. And now indeed, the definition is not hard to remember because it's very similar to the variance. First, we take the deviation of x to its average, so x minus expectation of x, and then we multiply this by the deviation of y to its average. So the square you know from the variance is now a product of two different random variables. And then finally, we simply take the expectation of this whole thing. So what comes out for the covariance is again a real number. However, here please note, in general this could be definitely also a negative number. And this is in contrast to the normal variance. However, similar to the ordinary variance, we can reformulate this formula here. This means we just expand this product here. So we get x times y minus x times the expectation of y and similarly, minus y times the expectation of x. And finally, the last term would be plus the two expectations multiplied. So you see, indeed, the same calculation as in part 16. In fact, this also means that now, in the next step, we can use the linearity of the expectation. So we pull the minus and addition signs out, and also the scalars. And then we see this middle term here, we have two times. And in addition, the last term is just a constant that will not change under the expectation. However, now you see, we can put both terms together and we get a very nice short formula for the covariance. So you can remember, it's the expectation of the product minus the product of the expectations. So again, by our assumption, this real number is well defined and called the covariance of x and y. And moreover, this definition shows you that the covariance measures how close the two variables x and y are to independence. This makes sense because we already know what independence means for the expectations. In fact, if we assume that x and y are independent, we know that this expectation is just the product of the two expectations. In other words, the covariance is zero in this case. Conversely, if the covariance is very far away from zero, then the two random variables are also far away from being independent. However, heads up, the converse implication here is in general false. It's only correct in some special situations, for example in the case that both random variables are normally distributed. This is important to note, because often the covariance is easy to calculate, but the independence is hard to show. Nevertheless, we always have the contraposition here, which means if the covariance is not zero, 
the variables are not independent. However, now the question is, do we also know how much they are not independent? There, the covariance might be misleading because x and y for themselves could already have very big variances. Therefore, we need some kind of normalization to actually get a measurement for uncorrelated variables. Indeed, this is a definition we can put here. If the covariance is zero, x and y are called uncorrelated. So we already know this new notion is weaker than the notion independence. Okay, then back to this property here. And maybe you have already noticed the covariance is nothing else than the variance if we put in the same random variable. Therefore, we can answer the following question. What is bigger, the covariance squared or the two variances multiplied? Indeed, this is not hard to show because it's exactly the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for integrals. For this reason, I don't want to go into the details, but we will use this inequality now for the next definition. Indeed, this is exactly the normalization we wanted from the beginning. So what we do is that we take the square root and bring everything to the left hand side. And then what we get is the standard deviation in the denominator. And of course we have the one with x and the one of y. And now by the inequality we know that this number lies between minus 1 and plus 1. And the usual symbol one uses for this number is a lowercase rho. And in the index we put the two random variables x and y. Now there are different names for this coefficient around but I will simply call it correlation coefficient. Okay and there you see with that we now have a measurement that tells us how correlated two random variables are. Here being close to zero means the two random variables are close to independence. On the other hand being close to minus or plus one means they are very far off of being independent so they are very correlated. However this is just a quick overview. Later we will go more into the details about the correlation coefficient. In this video here now I want to show you an example. Indeed I want to show you that uncorrelated variables don't have to be independent. Also this means for this example we cannot use normally distributed random variables. However let's keep it simple. Let's choose omega consisting out of three elements. So very simple and let's call the elements a, b, c. And now our probability measure p should be uniform on omega. This means all the singletons here have the same probability and it has to be one third. Indeed that's what you know, that's what we mean by a uniform distribution on a discrete set. And now missing is only the explicit definition of the two random variables. And we can do that by saying what they do with the three elements. Now x should send the first one to 1, the second one to 0 and the last one to minus 1. So not so complicated and now let's do the same for y. Now most importantly I want that y is equal to 0 whenever x is not equal to 0. Hence only for b we can have a non-vanishing value. Hence this means that the new random variable given by x times y is simply the zero function. Therefore, also the expectation of this random variable will be equal to zero. However, also by construction, the expectation of x is equal to zero. So by using the formula above, we conclude that the covariance between x and y is equal to zero. So indeed, they are uncorrelated simply because how they act on each element. Therefore, now the remaining question is, what is about the independence? And there you have to recall what does it mean that two random variables are independent. It simply means that the two events x is less or equal than x and y is less or equal than y are independent events. More precisely it means that the probability of this event can be written as a product of two probabilities. Indeed this is how we have defined independence of random variables. And moreover, it should hold no matter which numbers you choose for lowercase x and lowercase y. Therefore, I would say, let's test what happens if we set x to minus 1 and y to 0. Then, on the left hand side, let's put in all the elements of omega that fulfill both inequalities. 
and there we see this is only fulfilled for c. Only there x is sent to minus 1. However, now on the right hand side we find something different. We also find the probability of c in the first factor, but in the second factor we find more. There we have the probability of c and a. However, we see this is not the factor 1 because the element b is missing here. In other words, this equation here cannot be satisfied. But of course, you can also put in the numbers and then you see the left hand side is not equal to the right hand side. And this simply means now that x and y are not independent random variables. Ok, so I think that's good enough for today as an introduction into correlation. And I would say we go deeper into these topics with the next videos. So I really hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.